In nearly every culture, there are sayings and stories that tell us when building a house, you should make the foundation strong. In nearly every story, the common theme is that building on sand is a bad idea. But in the animal kingdom, you have to work with what you can get. There is one beastie that lives on the beaches around Europe that actually builds its house out of sand. Let me tell you about the wonderful honeycomb worm. Despite looking barren, the seashore is teeming with life. If you live in the United Kingdom or Ireland and go to the beach, the first place people look for life is in the rock pools, where they'll find things like crabs, anemones and fishes. You might have seen a bizarre structure that forms large humps on part of the beach between the high and low tide. When the tide is out, these lumpy structures look like a type of rock, but they aren't a rock at all. In fact, if you look closer, you can see these structures have a honeycomb shape and are made out of sand grains. These structures are actually a type of house built by a tiny invertebrate creature, which is a type of polychaete worm. But what the heck is a polychaete? So before we go any further, we need to talk a bit about worms. The word worm comes from Old English and is used to describe pretty much any thin tube-like animal that doesn't have legs. But the specific group of animals that we're talking about today are the annelida. The word annelid comes from Latin and means little ring because one of the key characteristics of the annelids is a segmented body. Annelids are one of the most diverse groups of invertebrates with over 18,000 described species and they come in all sorts of shapes and colours. They live in pretty much all types of ecosystems from the oceans, to fresh water and even on land. Some of them are extremely hardy animals and are known to live in some of the most extreme environments on the planet, and that makes them cool as hell. Annelids can be broadly split into two main groups, the polychaetes and the clitinates. These names might seem complicated, but chances are you would recognise the clitinates. They're the group of animals that have specialised to live in fresh water and on land, and contain the wonderful and amazing earthworms, and many others, including the creepy but fascinating blood-sucking leeches. The other group of annelids are the polychaetes, and these are the critters I want to talk to you about today. If you enjoy fishing, you've probably used a polychaete, like a ragworm, as bait, but most people have probably never come across them, and that's a shame because they're a really fascinating group of animals. Almost all polychaetes live in the ocean, and like other annelids, they have segmented bodies. But another cool characteristic is they have these paired bundles of bristles made of chitin that we call chiti. In fact, these bristles are where polychaetes get their name from, because polychaetes in Latin means many hairs. These chiti emerge from polychaetes on these tiny little fleshy nubbins called parapodia, and they're very versatile. Some polychaetes use them to swim or to crawl, and they're surprisingly nimble at it, which means that they are excellent active predators. Other species of polychaete use their chiti to anchor themselves in burrows or dwelling tubes, where they filter feed nutrients out of the water column. Polychaetes have a huge diversity and come in nearly every colour, and they can be spectacularly beautiful, and many of them could have an episode on this YouTube channel in their own right. Some of the most iconic polychaetes include the beautiful Christmas tree worms that live in burrows that they bore into corals. These little polychaetes are about an inch long and have long feathery hair crowns that are highly coloured, and they use them to filter feed microscopic plants out of the water. When startled, Christmas tree worms rapidly retract into their barrows, hiding from would-be predators. Another cool polychaete species are the giant tube worms that live in the deepest part of the ocean in close proximity to hydrothermal vents that are called black smokers. The water given off by the black smokers is boiling hot and lethal to most organisms, but the tube worms can grow to giant sizes. Some of them can be up to three meters in length. They lack a mouth or digestive system, but survive by having an extraordinary symbiotic relationship with bacteria that break down the minerals fired into the ocean by the black smokers. These bacteria are kept in special tissues within the worms, and when the bacteria break down the minerals, they excrete organic waste, which feeds the worms all the nutrients they need. This type of symbiotic relationship is very rare in nature, and is known as a chemoautotrophic symbiosis. While these two polychaete species lead quite docile and sessile lives, some polychaetes are vivacious predators. The bearded fireworm can reach 30 centimeters in length, and they stalk tropical reefs across most of the Atlantic Ocean. 
They feed on soft and hard corals, anemones, and small crustaceans. Normally, they aren't bothered by humans, but if handled, their kitty can penetrate human skin and are capable of injecting a neurotoxin that produces intense irritation or a burning sensation around the area of contact. The sting can also lead to quite severe nausea and dizziness, and they look fabulous. One of the most famous predatory polychaetes is probably the sand striker, which has a notoriety on the internet from viral videos of them devouring fish several times larger than themselves. These terrifying ambush predators wait for night to fall, and then they lie in their burrows with only their five little antennae poking out into the sediment, waiting for unsuspecting prey to move past them. Then, with lightning speed, they strike with their huge jaws, stunning their prey and dragging them in a heartbeat deep into their burrows to chow down on. Some of their strikes are so powerful that they can cut fish clean in half, and they tackle prey many times larger than themselves. From a paleontological perspective, polychaetes are an ancient group of animals. They have been around for at least 500 million years and have survived every one of the mass extinctions that has happened on Earth. That being said, polychaete fossils are very rare. They have no bones and very few hard parts, so when they die, they rot away quickly, and this stops them from becoming fossils. Some polychaetes, like the sand striker we talked about earlier, have very strong jaws, and these decay very slowly. We find fossil polychaete jaws quite regularly, but sometimes, in some special ancient environments, conditions were just right to allow the soft bodies of polychaetes to turn into fossils. One of my favourite soft-bodied polychaete fossils are Canadia spinosa and Burgessachita setigera, that lived about 500 million years ago during the Cambrian period, and are known from the famous Burgess Shale site in Canada. From these fossils, paleontologists have a good understanding about the evolution of annelids. We think that the annelid ancestor was probably an active organism that lived and scuttled along the seafloor. These fossils also help cement the hypothesis that clitolates evolved from polychaete ancestors, and this has been confirmed by studies comparing the DNA of these two annelid groups. So now we know a little about polychaetes and their evolution, we can go back to the beach and to the honeycomb worms. These little polychaetes are only a few centimetres long, normally between two and three. Each little worm builds a protective honeycomb-shaped tube from sand and shell fragments, which it sticks together using a mucous cement which they secrete. You would think that the little worm would get battered to death by the waves, but actually the worms need the waves to survive, because the tides bring in the plankton that they feed on. They catch the plankton by extending feeding tentacles from a special apparatus called a branchial crown, which they also use to catch the grains of sand when they build their homes. Each tube has an overhanging porch to keep the worms safe when they hide at low tide. The houses are built on a hard substrate, like a rock or on coastal defences, and the worms will clump together in colonies of thousands or even millions of individuals, and they can span for thousands of square metres along the coastline. Most people think worms are slimy and gross, but they're actually super important animals. They play a vital part in food webs, such as food for birds and fishes and pretty much any predator, and in some parts of the world are considered a delicacy. But they also play a vital role in creating ecosystems. Both polychaetes and clitolates, like the earthworms, play vital roles in mixing up the sediment they live in and allow oxygen and nutrients to penetrate it. This means that other animals can inhabit these ecosystems easier, and in the case of earthworms, it means that human beings can grow better crops in poorer soil. By building homes, honeycomb worms create a large reef system that biologists call biogenic reefs. These reefs are really important to other animals who live on the seashore because they can support their own ecosystem. One recent study identified 38 different species of animal living on one well-established honeycomb reef off the coast of the UK. Honeycomb worms are hardcore little critters, living under the waves in houses of sand, hoovering up their fast food. But sadly, honeycomb worms are under threat and are having a bit of a tough time in the UK and Ireland. Pollution from industry and farming runoff can poison the water for worms, but one of the biggest pressures that the honeycomb worm faces is from us going to the beach. Many holiday makers and tourists have never seen these structures before, and they don't know that a honeycomb worm is a living reef. People will often touch them, and worse, walk on them when they're exploring the rock pools, and that can have devastating consequences for the colony. Walking on the reef crushes the honeycombs and the worms inside them, but it also creates weaknesses which can increase erosion from the waves, smashing the whole colonies apart and killing the reef. So it's really important that if you visit the beach, not to walk on them. I hope you've enjoyed the second episode of my series. 
I'm putting together the next episode now, where we will be talking about animals that can glow in the dark. Remember to subscribe to my channel so you don't miss out on that. Thank you so much for watching, and stay safe.